from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Patrick Anderson. I review fiction for the Washington Post. Uh, everybody at the Post is very, very honored to be part of this great event and to be a sponsor of this great event. And we're very grateful to all of you for turning out and making it such a success. Uh, today I have the, the, the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, the international, internationally best-selling novelist, Jeffrey Deaver. Mr. Deaver grew up near Chicago and was a journalist, folk singer, and lawyer before he turned to fiction with great success. He's published more than 30 novels, including 12 in his Lincoln Rhyme series and four, I believe, now in the Catherine Dance series as well as, uh, I think, 11 standalones. Several of his books have been filmed, including The Bone Collector, and he's been nominated for seven Edgar Awards from the Mystery Writers of America, an Anthony, an Anthony Award, and just about all the awards, actually. Mr. Deaver's first novel was published in 1988, and he has said he was inspired to write it um, because of his admiration for Ian Fleming's James Bond novel, From Russia with Love. More than 20 years later, the, the circle was completed when he became the second American chosen uh, to write one of the authorized Bond sequels, uh, Carte Blanche, which was published in 2011. It's a pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Deaver. Nice to see you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Uh, my associate, Sharon, who has been uh, assisting me so ably today, uh, fellow authors and uh, attendees at this wonderful, wonderful event. Now, I've been writing full-time for 27 years. I've written 36 novels, hundreds of short stories, poems, a radio play, an album of country-western songs, some nonfiction pieces. Um, but there's one thing I have not tried yet, and I thought I would plagiarism. <clears throat> I, uh, I say that with a, a bit of a grain of salt. I've been working on a book about writing fiction for some years now, and much of it is based on quotations from other authors whom I admire. So I, I, I thought that today, rather than read from one of my own books, which I guarantee would disincline you from buying them, I would share with you some of uh, these wonderful folks' uh, thoughts. and. Uh, 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 let you partake of some of the advice and the opinions and inspiration that I have been enlightened by and informed by. Now, uh, we're going to go through it chapter by chapter. Don't worry, we will still have time to get out of here before dark uh, because I've extracted merely a few quotations from them. First, however, I think we need to invoke some devil's advocates. Um, and these, which, um, like much else of what I'm going to tell you, is in the form of a quotation from Lillian Hellman, if I had to give young writers any advice, I would say don't listen to writers giving advice. <laughs> and the second caveat is this from Somerset Mom: There are three simple rules for writing a great novel. Sadly, no one knows what they are. <laughs> well, I disagree. I think, um, with all respect to those fine, if slightly disparate writers, I believe that we can learn to write, given a certain degree of inspiration and um, motivation to do so. Um, so let's go through now the chapters of my proposed book and look at how people have decided to approach this wonderful and occasionally exasperating world of writing. So we begin chapter one, why write? Why does one want to write? William Sapphire said, I write because I enjoy expressing myself, and writing forces me to think more coherently than I do when I'm just shooting off my mouth. <laughs> Reynolds Price, I write because it's the only thing that I'm really very good at in the whole world, and I've got to stay busy to keep out of trouble or keep from going crazy. Jonathan Safran Foer, why do I write? It's not that I want people to think I'm smart or even that I'm a good writer. I write because I want to end loneliness. Books make people less alone. And therefore, before and after everything else, that's what books do. They show us that conversations are possible across distance. 
James Thurber, I write because it's fun. William Burroughs, as a young child, I wanted to be a writer because writers were rich and famous. They lounged around Singapore in Rangoon, smoking opium in a yellow pongee silk suit. They sniffed cocaine in Mayfair and lived in the native quarter of Tangier, smoking hashish and languidly caressing their pet gazelle. <laughs> J.R.R. Tolkien, I've claimed that escape is one of the main functions of writing stories, and I don't accept the scorn or pity with which, quote, escape is now so often used. Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he wants to get out and go home? Now, why do I myself write? I started writing when I was uh, quite young, about uh, eight or nine years old, because I knew even then there was something magical about storytelling. After all, people have told stories and listened to stories for thousands and thousands of years. Books take us out of our daily life. Books teach us things about worlds and people we have no way of knowing about otherwise. Um, books connect people. I remember being the new kid on the schoolyard or possibly seeing someone new who had come into my school and I didn't know who on earth that person was, but he was holding a copy of the Martian Chronicles or a copy of The Hobbit. And you kind of walked up to him and said shyly, uh, hi, how you doing? You're new here, right? Uh-huh. I see you're reading The Hobbit. And suddenly his eyes lit up, and even though you really didn't know that person before, you did know him then. Books are good. Storytelling's good. And I knew from that early age I wanted to be part of that world. Well, we're going to go to chapter two now, and that is finding a subject to write about. If we're going to write a book, we have to write about something. Francine Matthews said this, I always heard write about what you know. Oh, I disagree. I say write about what you love. You can always research the rest. Stephen King said, writers remember everything, especially the hurts. Strip a writer to the bone, point to the scars, and he'll tell you every story of each small one. From the big scars, you get novels. Oh, a little talent is a nice thing to have if you want to be a writer, but the only real requirement is the ability to remember the story of every scar. Meg Cabot, write the kind of story you'd like to read. People will give you all sorts of advice about writing, but if you're not writing something you like, no one else is going to like it either. Flannery O'Connor, anybody who survived his childhood has enough information about life as a writer to last for the rest of his days. <laughs> I myself write um, uh, to come up with ideas that I think uh, are, well, I'll describe it this way. I was on a panel in England some years ago uh, next to a, um, a doyen of cozy writing, and I'm sure many of you being in the Mystery Pavilion here know what a cozy is. It's kind of a softer boiled sort of uh, story. Um, Agatha Christie, for instance. And the question was posed to the panel, where do you get your ideas? And she said, well, let me think. And out of respect to you, I'm not gonna try the accent, uh, but uh, you can imagine a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, older British woman uh, explaining this. Uh, I'll tell you where I get my ideas. I sit down in my parlor with a cup of tea and I wait for my muse, whose name was, I can't recall, I think it's Philomena or Frederica, to come down out of the clouds with her magic wand and tap me on the head and poof, there's an idea. Oh, I did the same thing, I chortled. Now, I chortled until I looked out over the audience and saw they were gazing at her with adoring eyes and thinking, go Philomena, go Frederica. And I, you know, I tried to turn the chortle into a cough, but I'd already, already blown it there. And the question, question then came to me, Mr. Deaver, where do you get your ideas? And you know, in this day and age of the internet, everything you've said is out there forever, so I, I couldn't backtrack. I said, well, I'll tell you. I sit down in, um, we don't have parlors in America so much, but I sit down in my den with a beverage. <laughs> it's not tea. And I, I simply try to figure out a way to scare the ever-living hell out of you. Um, I always keep in mind Mickey Spillane's dictum that people don't read books to get to the middle. <laughs> I don't pick up a 500 page book saying I cannot wait to get to page 250 and put it down because it's boring and dull. 
we authors need the wherewithal to grab the readers by the lapels on the first chapter, if not the first page, and race them through to the very end of the story. Um, I do that by coming up with an idea that uh, takes place over a very short period of time. Uh, there are lots of multiple twists and turns, big surprise ending followed by, if you've read my books, yes, you know, a big surprise ending, and after that there's a big surprise ending. Keep the story moving. Ask on every three or four pages what is going to happen next. Next, Make the reader wonder. There's an unresolved conflict here. What is going to happen next? Um, those are the ideas I, I come up with. You get into a taxi cab in New York and it goes the wrong direction than you think you should be going and you cannot open the doors because it's locked. The beginning of The Bone Collector. Okay, that, uh, we're talking about the chapters of uh, advice about writing. Now we're going to look at chapter three, planning the novel. Uh, quotations again, Gustave Flaubert, books aren't made the way babies are. <laughs> They're made like pyramids. Uh, there's some long pondered plan and then great blocks of stone are placed one atop the other. It's back-breaking, sweaty, time-consuming work. Joyce Carol Oates, the first sentence cannot be written until the last sentence is written. And Hemingway, prose is architecture, it's not interior design. I myself, well, I just think about this. I don't get on an airplane that's been built the way I would build an airplane, which means I have no idea how to build an airplane. We get on airplanes that have been built according to tried and true engineering diagrams, uh, computer specifications, charts, graphs. You know, when that test pilot gets on the plane for the first time, he doesn't go like this. I'm, I'm kind of a Presbyterian, so I don't really get all, but you know what I'm saying. He, 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 he knows it's gonna fly. There may be some fine tuning. Why should a book be any different? And I admit the world is divided into those who outline and those who don't. I am an outliner. Outline, outline, outline. I spend eight months, full-time job, outlining my books. I need to do that. Books are structure as well as their uh, prose. Fine, wonderful prose. Um, you know, I'm speaking of g uh, genre writing, murder, mystery, thriller, crime writing, but I think it's true of many books. I would even say some literary novels meander far more than they should, even though the prose is scintillating and the characterization is wonderful. I want a story, I want a structure. That's one reason to outline. There's another reason, and I'm not gonna ask anybody here to raise their hand, but you simply have to ask yourself, have you ever read a book that should not have been written? <laughs> I see a brave soul out there, thank you. I'll, I'll go on record as saying that. Okay, imagine this, you've got a wonderful idea for a book, and it is a, 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 a good idea for your first chapter. You bang it out, oh, it's exciting, a wonderful set piece. Then you write the second chapter, and the third chapter, and the fourth chapter, and then you come to like chapter 17. There's something about that nasty 17 chapter. And you don't quite know what's gonna come next, and that's the middle of the book, and you don't have a middle for the book. But you bang out something that's full of cliches, and then you, um, uh, you look at the end, and there's really no end. You have to have, you know, a deus ex machina, some, some contrived ending that, that's not organic to the story. And suddenly you end up with, you know, maybe 600 pages of probably very well done prose, but the story doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Um, when you sit back and read that, you as an author have two choices. One is to do the morally courageous thing and throw it out. Dump it, 100% of it. And don't cha save chapter three because it's a good chapter three. Because if you can write a good chapter three in a bad book, you can write a great chapter three in a good book. Throw it all out or do what I admit I have done from time to time and others have done. You tack on that cliche middle, you add a, a, a very uh, uh, bad ending and put it out into the stream of commerce. We owe our readers much, much more than that. Now, what if you had started that brilliant idea in outline form and your little first bullet point was something about this set piece or that set piece and then your second bullet point was this. You come to bullet point 17 after a week or two and you say, you know what, this just isn't working. This just isn't gonna work. You wad up five, six, seven, eight pages of outline, throw it away and start over with something new. I am a firm believer in outline, and of course, uh, Somerset Maugham 
Uh, you know, nobody knows what the rules are. Well, I'm sorry, that's, that's one rule. Organize ahead of time. You don't have to do it as obsessively as I do. My outlines tend to be about 100 pages long. Uh, you don't have to do that. But you do need to know where you're going. Um, okay, chapter four, writing the novel itself. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne said this, a writer's words should dissolve into pure thought. Nothing self-conscious about your writing. Stephen King, any word you have to hunt for in a thesaurus is the wrong word. <laughs> Mark Twain, the difference between the almost right word and the right word is the difference between the lightning bug and lightning. From the inimitable literary philosopher, Dr. Seuss. It has often been said there's so much to be read, you can never cram all those words in your head. So the writer who breeds more words than he needs is making a chore for the reader who reads. That's why my belief is, the briefer the brief is, the greater the sigh of the reader's relief is. And that's why your books have such power and strength. You publish with shorth. Shorth is better than length. <laughs> Stephen King, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. <laughs> Ernest Hemingway, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. <laughs> I'm going to quote Stephen King once more. He gets, uh, he gets a little more uh, space in my comments because he wrote a wonderful book called On Writing. And if you have not read it, it's uh, quasi-autobiographical as well as some wonderful advice about uh, writing. He said this, I believe that the first draft of a book, even a long one, should take no more than three months. Any longer than that, and for me at least, the story begins to take on an odd foreign feel, sort of like a dispatch from the Romanian Department of Public Affairs, or something broadcast on high, wave short, on high band short wave during a period of severe sunspot activity. And I do believe this as well. Once I have the outline done, I can sit down and bang out the story uh, rather uh, quickly. And this, this is advantageous for several reasons. Um, one, I may wake up. It, it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. And I look at my outline, and that's the day I'm supposed to viciously murder someone. And I just don't, I just don't feel like it. And some of you are just staring at me. With this. Maybe you do want to viciously murder somebody on... <laughs> on those days. I myself saved the vicious murder for the days when, um, you know, I call, I'm not going to mention Time Warner Cable by name. <laughs> oh, please don't let them be a sponsor of the National Book Festival. But uh, anyway, and, and you know, my cable's out and we writers, as some of you writers know, will do anything to keep from writing. So we need that cable to work. And it's out, and they say, we'll have a man there at 8.30 tomorrow morning. And he doesn't show up at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30. He shows up at 5.30, and he didn't bring the parts he needs. Those are the days when I want to viciously murder somebody <laughs> and write, write, those, um, write those scenes. Um, so uh, out it goes, uh, you know, bang, 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 quickly. I, uh, my most recent book, the one I'm just finishing now, a Lincoln Rhyme novel for next year, has um, about 100, you know, maybe 60 chapters, 133,000 words. I wrote that in two and a half months. Now, remember, I, I did the outline for another six or eight months, so I knew where it was going to go. But I could, for as long as I was physically able to sit in the chair, bang out the prose, that was, uh, that was fine. But um, now, so that's writing the book itself, bang, out it comes. Now, it's not ready yet, we've got to revise and edit. Ernest Hemingway again, there are no great writers. There are only great rewriters. Um, Elmore Leonard, if it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. <laughs> Stephen King, when your story is ready for rewrite, cut it to the bone. Get rid of every ounce of excess fat. This is going to hurt. Revising a story down to the bare essentials is always a little like murdering children, but it must be done. <laughs> I do like to think that King was referring to the editing and not infanticide. I, uh, I rewrite 50 times. Um, there are people far smarter than I, far more perceptive. I set the book aside for as long as I can and then go back and rewrite. I do about half of that on the computer and half on the printed page. Um, on the computer, obviously, you can cut and paste. You can change, globally search things. Uh, you can scan through it quickly, move chapters around if you want. Um, but I'll say two things about that. One, the 
Um, the cognitive, um, and, and um, maybe there's a linguist here or some psychologist here who, uh, maybe even someone involved in the medical arts, who knows, when I read things on a screen, I see it differently than when I see it on paper. I can't explain that, but I, I, I don't process it quite as well on the computer screen. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, it's still easy to search and replace things. Say you have a character named Frank, and you don't like Frank. You want to change it to Sebastian. Search and replace. It's easy, right? Yes, but. Um, you got to outthink your computer a little bit because they make mistakes at the speed of light. Um, uh, Margaret Mitchell, therefore, might have written, Sebastian Lee, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> okay. So the, um, the um, rewrite, 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 out it comes, printed form, rewrite, rewrite, edit, rewrite. That 133,000 word manuscript that I, I just told you I finished, I didn't mention writing it in two and a half months, that it was crap. It, it was too long, there were a lot of mistakes, there were a lot of typos, I rewrote, rewrote, rewrote. It is now a much leaner 120,000 word manuscript. Oh, chapter six, you're gonna love this one if you're a writer, writer's block. I'm not gonna tell you who this quote came from. I'd like you to uh, maybe help me with that, see if you can figure it out. <clears throat> It, it was, it was a, it was a dark, <laughs> it was a dark and, it was a dark and stormy, it was a dark and stormy night. Whew, good writing is hard work. <laughs> Who was that? Snoopy the Beagle. Jack London. You can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. <laughs> Terry Pratchett, there's no such thing as writer's block. That was invented by people in California who can't write. <laughs> Douglas Adams, I love deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they go by overhead. <laughs> and on a somewhat more serious note, Lawrence Block said this, one thing that helps is to give myself permission to write badly. I tell myself that I'm gonna do five or 10 pages no matter what, and I can always tear them up the following morning if I want. I'll have lost nothing. Writing and tearing up five pages would leave me no further behind than if I wrote nothing at all. Uh, for me, I, I agree um, with, with Pratchett. There really is no such thing as writer's block, but there is idea block. Everyone in this room can write if you have an idea, can write a book, write a short story, but you need that idea. And if you're struggling, it may very well be that that's an idea that you should not write. Again, there are books that should not be written, but you have it within you to write something. You just have to find the story that you have. Chapter seven, we can't talk about writing without this wonderful topic, critics and rejection. Sebastian Junger, I wrote my first novel in seventh grade, longhand in a green composition notebook, my teacher read it aloud to the class, chapter by chapter. No wonder I didn't have any friends. <laughs> Neil Gaiman, remember when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. When they tell you how to fix it, they are almost always wrong. David Mitchell, if you show someone something you've written, what you're doing is giving them a sharpened stake, lying down in your coffin and saying, when you're ready, I, uh, I myself have had hundreds of rejections. I'll tell you two of my favorites. Uh, I sent a, a manuscript into a, a publisher, and uh, you authors, uh, of course, know, and potential authors, know what a self-addressed stamped envelope is. Nowadays, it's much more electronic, but back in the day, you would send in your manuscript with an envelope into which the manuscript would fit with postage on it so that the publisher could send you back one of two things, bars of gold and a contract for your uh, for the, your 10-year publishing ventures, or more likely the manuscript back. Well, I received the manuscript back, ripped it open, the envelope, uh, uh, hoping for a uh, rejection letter that was kind of a, a pithy and helpful guide to how I could revise the manuscript. No, I didn't get that. I did get the manuscript. It had been dropped on the uh, floor somewhere, just jumbled up, pages every which away. There was no rejection letter. It was my own cover letter, upside down, with a footprint on it. And at the time, I thought, well, that's okay. It was just a mistake. 
they, they dropped it accidentally. I, I actually now know what I do know about publishing. They drew straws to see who could step on the, 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 the rejection letter and stuff it back in the envelope and send it to me. That same manuscript um, got a, a rejection letter that, that uh, uh, sent it in. I did get a rejection letter back, and it was rather uh, pathetic of me. When I got it back, I, I, I touched the letter, and I said, is it, is it Xerox, or is it real? And I rubbed it on my cheek. Oh, no, it was actually typed. I could feel the little bumps. I was so excited. And it said this, dear Mr. Deaver, thank you for your submission. This manuscript is unpublishable. Very truly yours. And um, I took that as such good news because it said, thank you for your submission and very truly yours. I took that as, as encouragement to keep writing. And a, a little coda to this story, um, five years later, uh, three years later, I guess, when I submitted that manuscript under a different title and it was published and did fairly well, um, it went to the same publisher that had called it unpublishable. A different, a different editor, uh, in, uh, in fairness. Rejection is part of the game, folks, but you have to remember, it's a speed bump. It is not a brick wall. Um, I'm just checking the time here. It's not that there's something more interesting. It's not Angry Birds, just for the record. It is. OK, chapter eight, humorous interlude, famous rejection letters. I'm sorry, Mr. Kipling. You just don't know how to use the English language. <laughs> Your poems are quite as remarkable for defects as for beauties and are devoid of poetical qualities. Emily Dickinson. It would be an extremely rotten taste to say nothing of horribly cruel should we want to publish your novel, Mr. Hemingway. <laughs> it's impossible to sell animal stories in the United States of George Orwell's Animal House. Um, uh, uh, Norman Mailer got this. This manuscript, were we to publish, would set publishing back 25 years. For your own sake, do not publish this book, D.H. Lawrence, Lady Chatterley's lover. You're welcome to Le Carre. He hasn't got any future. You'd have a decent book here if you got rid of that Gatsby character. And finally, first, we must ask, does it have to be a whale? Yes, Moby Dick. <laughs> Chapter 9, The Daily Life of a Writer. J.K. Rowling, be ruthless about protecting your writing days. That is, do not cave in to the endless requests to have essential or long overdue meetings on those days. The funny thing is that although writing has been my actual job for several years now, I sti still seem to have to find time to do it. People don't grasp that I have to sit down in peace and write books, apparently believing that they pop up like mushrooms without my connivance. I must therefore guard the time allotted to writing as a Hungarian horn tail guards its firstborn egg. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau, write while the heat is on you. The writer who postpones recording his thoughts uses an iron, which is cooled, to burn a hole with. Ray Bradbury said, you must write every single day of your life. You must lurk in libraries and climb the stacks like ladders to sniff books like perfume and wear books like hats upon your heads. You must be in love every day and out of that love for books, make a world. For myself, writing is a job. I spend uh, eight to 10 hours a day doing it. Uh, it's a job I love. Uh, I find it uh, satisfying. I find it frustrating from times like that. Um, I'm on the road two to three months out of the year on book tour. And when I teach my seminars in writing, I, I tell my students right up front, um, you define your own relationship with books. You define the life you want to lead as a writer. One is not better than the other, uh, but you just have to figure out where you fall in this uh, crazy world. Do you want to do what I do, make a living writing? Uh, a, a book. I do that. I write a book every year, sometimes every two years. I pay the bills with my books. I'm very, very fortunate to be able to do that. I work very, very hard uh, to do that as well. Or do you want to have written a book, a wonderful, uh, uh, maybe a, a you know a, a Bildungsroman?
Roman, something uh, 5,000 pages of, of your life or someone else's life uh, that d you devote 10 years to, that's absolutely fine while you carry on another, uh, another life. You just have to kind of define what you need, uh, what you need to do and what, what, what pleasure you derive, derive from it. Now, I've given you certain um, uh, somewhat funny, somewhat harrowing uh, aspects of writing. What about the joy of writing? And that is what it all comes down to, the joy of writing. The final chapter, I gain nothing but pleasure from writing fiction. Short stories are foreplay, novellas are heavy petting, but novels, well, they're the full Monty. <laughs> Truman Capote, to me, the greatest pleasure of writing is not what it's about, but the music the words make. Ray Bradbury, I have never worked a day in my life. The joy of writing has propelled me from minute to minute to day to day to year to year. Writing gives me such enormous pleasure, says Julie Meyerson. I'm a much happier and therefore nicer person when I'm doing it. Writing feels like something I, something I simply could not live without. It's a joyous thing. I feel very lucky to be paid to do it, but even if I'd never been published, I think I'd still be writing. I love being read, but the person I'm really writing for is always myself. Well, these are just a fraction of the thoughts that writers have shared about their craft and about how they tell stories. Don't, don't we see how varied uh, are these authors and the works they create? How separated in time and geography and sensibilities and the forms they use in creating their stories. But if we step back, we can see they all have one thing in common, and that's the passionate desire to reach into the hearts and minds of readers with their words and make those people laugh or cry or scream in terror or better understand this mad world we live in. And in doing so, make our time on this earth a little saner, a little richer, and frankly, a little more fun. And you can quote me on that one. Well, thank you. Now I have uh, intentionally left, I think we have about 10 minutes uh, for some questions, and uh, if you would be so kind as to come down here and uh, speak to the uh, microphone uh, so we can uh, record you if you like, uh, and I will answer questions about anything, except I have yet to announce my uh, Republican candidacy for the president. Uh, <laughs> um. Come on, I, and I, I, you know, I teach and I call on people and I love to make people squirm in my books and outside of my books. I think we have a gentleman here. Sure, the question was would I say a, a word or two about agents and publishers? Um, I have um, followed my publishing, I grew up in the world, my writing world, uh, in the traditional model. Uh, when I started in the 80s, uh, there was really not, not no viable self publishing. Um, I got an agent very early, and I would strongly recommend uh, getting an agent. Publishing nowadays, there are many different venues, of course, traditional publishers, as well as uh, self-publishing and uh, publishers uh, halfway in between. I'm an advocate of the traditional model. Um, I think if you write a good book, a solid book, you will get an agent, uh, and you will uh, publish according to the um, um, the economic model that works best, and that is the agent will pay you, an, uh, sorry, the publisher will pay you in advance, and that advance goes a long way in encouraging the publisher to, um, to promote the book. Um, I, I see nothing creatively wrong with self-publishing, but you will have a better market even if it takes longer. You will, you will develop a much better audience. Uh, the other thing I would say is social media. Use it, use it, use it. And when you're sick and tired of it, use it some more. You have to do it. Any other questions? Yes, please. I'm interested in the fact that you wrote one of the 007 books. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? Did they kind of give you the plot, or how much freedom did you have? And just sort of talk about it. Sure. Thanks. Um, yes, a few years ago, I won an award in England for a book that was sort of spy-ish. And in my comments, I. Um, I, th I thanked uh, the association giving me the award. I also thanked the Ian Fleming estate and said that I, I was very influenced by Fleming when I was growing up. I was reading Bond when I was eight or nine years old. And um, you know, you think that maybe was not quite appropriate for a kid, but in fact, back then, the books are very euphemistic. 
uh, you know, that was, they were written in the 50s, and it was a much tamer time back then. And uh, the movies have pushed Bond uh, in a slightly different direction. But, um, and so they were, uh, I guess, pleased at my comments. And I, uh, I, about a year later, I got a call from them saying, would I be interested in writing the new James Bond book? And I debated five seconds and said, yes, of course. <laughs> And, uh, and they, were, they were great about it. I, um, I said, well, uh, I, I can't submit chapters. I don't write that way. You gathered from my comments. I do the, uh, an outline, and that takes a long time, and then I, I do the book. So I, I did submit them an outline, and I said, uh, then I'm going to do the book on my own. I, don't, I can't send it to you. And if you don't want it, you, you know, they had absolute right to reject it. And uh, they said, no, that's fine. And they, they didn't. They, they seemed to like it. The book did very, uh, did, did very well. Um, and I uh, would consider doing another one. I, I kind of had to get back to my own writing, so I told them I probably would uh, be a few years before I get back to it, but, but I, I did enjoy it. Carte Blanche is the book, and it's set in the present day. Bond was a uh, young veteran of the Afghan campaign, British soldiers in the uh, late 2000s, and um, uh, it was it kind of harkened back to the original, uh, the original books, and I enjoyed writing it very much. Uh, yes, you have a question, please? Yes, it also has to do with the Bond book. I would be very interested in your description of the themes in books about espionage and how they might be the same or different from the other kinds of writings that you've done. I'm sorry, there's a little echo here. Um, I'll repeat the question. Can you hear now? Uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you come up here? Because I'm getting a big echo. So just, All right. you, so, sorry, it's just a huge amount of feedback up here. Okay, thank you, I understood. Actually, you said theme, and I heard the word bee, and I'm trying to think, did James, was James Bond attacked by a horde of bees? I didn't know. I, no, the, I actually, think your book got yeah, a thank you. Actually, you know what, the, um, uh, the carte blanche and the, uh, the great amount of research I did into espionage uh, was, really went um, hand in glove with my, uh, with my other books. Um, I write a lot about, even in the world of, of crime, the Lincoln Rhyme books, the Catherine Dance books, the standalone books, I write about kind of covert activity, not traditional national intelligence covert activity. And um, when I wrote the Bond book, I, um, I said to them, I'm gonna write a Deaver book, lots of twists and turns, unlike Fleming did, but it would be set in the national security world, England primarily, MI6, which is the SIS, and MI5, which is the uh, security service over there. And um, so it was, you know, it was very similar to what, I, uh, what I'd done. I had a lot of fun uh, researching it, though, and got to go to some really fun places that I can't tell you about, because then I would disappear and you'd never see me again. <laughs> Uh, any other uh, questions, please? All right. Well, I guess I will say in the, also in the uh, name of shameless self-promotion, I will be signing books downstairs at uh, booth six, wherever that is. And, uh, you know, we authors can be quite prima donnas. And uh, I was asked before about the protocol of signing. And I have to say, uh, you know, I, I, I will sign any book as long as I wrote it. <laughs> That's the rule right there. Thank you all so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.